Good evening. I am Justina Renzoni, the Historic Site Manager at the Georgia O'Keeffe Museum. Before we get started with our program, if you have not done so, please introduce yourself in the chat box. To find the chat, go to the bottom of the screen and click on chat. If you're using an iPad, the chat can be found at the top of the screen. The chat box will appear when you click on chat, so please also utilize the chat box for questions throughout the presentation and Kimmy will answer those at the end. Welcome to everyone who's tuning in this evening. It means so much that you are here supporting our creative community. I would like to extend a special welcome to all of our members for joining us today. Your support made this event possible. And if you're not yet a member and enjoy this program, please consider joining at gokm.org slash join or make a charitable donation at gokm.org slash give so we can continue hosting these programs. Today we will be joined by Kimmy Roars, ceramicist and owner of Whiskey and Clay, located in Santa Fe. As part of our program, we are hosting a month-long virtual pop-up store featuring many, many of her amazing works. Please check it out after the program at www.gokm.org slash showcase. Now I will turn the presentation over to Kimmy. Hi everyone, um, I'm just trying to figure out how to share my screen with you all, here we go. Okay, welcome. Um, so as Justina said, I'm Kimmy. I am so happy that you all could be here and I'm really excited to show you my studio. So um, I will give you kind of a brief overview of what we do, who we are, um, how our backgrounds kind of made this perfect storm to create whiskey and clay. And then um, I'll talk about our humble beginnings in Austin, Texas. And then I'm going to do a little uh, demo and show you the process. So first I'm gonna talk about the overview. So um, we are production potters here in Santa Fe. Um, I'll show you a couple photos here on my slides, um, but first of all, I'll tell you, so we're, we're production potters. That means that we do large orders um, for wholesale accounts, stores and restaurants, coffee shops, stuff like that. Um, it wasn't always that way. We used to, you know, just make fun stuff, um, but it kind of picked up pretty fast in that direction. So our intent with the pottery we make is to add joy to everyday life. Um, so as you can see here, the pieces on this photo, and then I'll show you one more in a moment. Um, they show the raw clay, which is, it's kind of a thing we do. We like to um, remind someone that's using the piece that they're holding the earth. Uh, it gives a really nice tactile experience. And that's kind of, that's kind of like our identity for the pottery. Here's another photo. On the left, you'll see just our retail shelves. There's a bunch of mugs and some bowls. Um, on the right is a vase. And as I said, you can see there's raw clay exposed. That's the brown part of it. The white stuff is the glaze, um, which I'll talk about much more later. So yeah, those are, that's kind of an example of our pieces. And now I'm going to talk about our backgrounds. So um, I'll start with me and then I'll talk about my partner. So as I said, I'm Kimmy. Um, I am from Maryland, I'm from Annapolis. And growing up, I was always a tinkerer. Um, I always liked to take stuff apart and figure things out. And um, even like from a year, an early age, I can remember my dad would sit us down at the kitchen table whenever something broke and we would just take it apart. You know, like however many pieces a camera turned out to be, I just learned so much from that kind of thing. So I also really loved the book, The Way Things Work. You know, you would open a random page and it would tell you how a stapler worked or something. And I loved that stuff. Um, and I've always been kind of interested in cars and we used to tinker on stuff like that. So fast forward to adulthood. I went to school for economics and philosophy um, in Virginia. I went to James Madison University. I did not study art. Um, I, um, I always had an interest, but not really anything serious. I wanted to do accounting, which is what I ended up doing. Um, I got a job as a staff accountant at a tech company after college. They moved me back to Austin, or I'm sorry, to Annapolis, um, where I lived for about a year. And all I had was accounting, and I just felt kind of lame. Um, I was dating this guy who broke up with me and I felt extremely lame because I got broken up with, I didn't have any like hobbies and everything going on. 
And I remember one day I was talking with my um, roommates, they were St. John's students. There's a campus in Annapolis and there's a campus here in Santa Fe. And I was in the living room just, you know, kind of pouring my heart out to them, talking about it and their girlfriends. One of them um, was drinking tea out of this like beautiful handmade mug. And I was just so enthralled by it. I didn't even, I didn't even know at the time that you could like hand make something and consume out of it. So she was like, let's go to my class. Like you can come with me. So we walked to a place called Maryland Hall, which is in downtown Annapolis. Um, it's like a old high school they've converted into a really great space. So I took a class and I felt I like, it was the tactile kind of maker experience I really wanted. And I could just keep making stuff and just like see the, the, the you know, my, my work into something. Um, and furthermore, it was the best mental distraction for a heartbreak. You know, I could just pour my heart out and like focus on that because in pottery, as I'm sure many of you know, like you can't have any distractions. You can't, your mind can't wander because your piece will just go off center. So pottery really worked for that for me. Um, I, um, this is Aaron and I, I'll talk about him in a moment. So I started doing pottery in Maryland. My job was a tech company and they moved me to Austin, Texas pretty soon after that. Found a studio in Austin. Um, I started working there, it was called Playways. It's no longer around um, these days, but I started working there. I joined with a class, had an amazing teacher, taught me so much, um, but I kind of got the itch to do it on my own pretty quickly after that, like make my own studio. So um, the class was good. I remember one day that it became really obvious to me. He was doing a lesson and he said it was called a lesson in wonky pots or like wabi-sabi pieces that are not perfect. And he said, oh, Kimmy, you can just sit this one out. Like that's essentially what I'd already been making, which I felt kind of offended by that. Um, I, I had a reputation for just like going with it. Like I would make something that was kind of messed up and I would just keep going. And I would want it fired. I would want to see what it looks like. Whereas a lot of people, you know, they would take the whole class to make one large piece. And I would make a bunch during class because I just liked that. Also, I kind of got kicked out of that studio. They didn't like that I was mixing clays to marble them. They didn't like that I, oh, we used glaze as glue to glue on a handle if it broke. <laughs> so I was definitely doing some illegal measures that got me kicked out of there. Um, so while I was at Clayways, I started, or I met this person, Aaron, who you see in the picture here. Um, I'll talk a little bit about our beginning together and then I'll talk about Aaron and his history. Um, so yeah, the t Aaron worked at the tech company. He was a software engineer. Um, I was an accountant, so there wasn't really much overlap. And I had a huge crush on him. So I used to deny his expense reports. So he would like have to come talk to me and we would like flirt and stuff. We start dating, we move in together. Um, it becomes really obvious that he's like a super capable kind of tinker, mechanic, maker kind of person as well. And um, so we find this great house in Austin to rent. It has this screened in porch, um, which I can show you, I think right here. Yeah, so the left picture is our screened in porch. Um, that was our first studio in Austin. And it was very makeshift. It did what it needed to do. Um, on the right was our kiln. So upon moving the, into this house, we had this Craig, Craigslist miracle happen where we just found the perfect kiln on Craigslist. We didn't even know what we were looking for. We were like, oh, that's a kiln, sure, let's buy that. We ended up buying a gas kiln, um, which is what we fire today. And it's the one on the right there. We, it just barely worked for what we needed. Um, we really put a lot of work into it. We were like the on ice trying to figure this thing out. All the while, still working our day jobs still making stuff in this little studio here um, and just trying to make it work. So I'll talk a little about Aaron's background and then more about our beginnings in Austin. So um, as I said, Aaron's a software engineer. He's extremely humble. So he'll, if you meet someone, he'll say, I'm, I do computer stuff, which I think is super sweet. He's a great software engineer. Um, he, he's, uh, he's also, you know, backyard mechanic, fixes stuff all his life. It sounds like he's been doing stuff like that. I remember seeing a photo of him and he had these like makeshift glasses. It was like this pair of frames and like you could tell the glass had been carved to fit in those frames. And I asked about it and he was like, oh, I just like those frames. So I made my glasses fit in them. <laughs> um, so yeah, we had this kind of perfect storm of skills. And furthermore, Aaron has been to Burning Man many times and is in that culture of like pyrotechnic people. So he's like, of course we can figure out a kiln for you. So yeah, our flow in Austin in the early days was I was working full time as an accountant. Um, I switched jobs a couple times. I worked at a brewery um, as their accountant for a while. And so I would work, you know, nine to five, come home. And we had orders at this time, which I'll tell you about in a moment. I would come home from work, pour some whiskey and just sit at the wheel and make clay until I like couldn't anymore, until I had to go to bed. Some nights it was so late. 
Um, and that was the weekends too. So our life, or my life, outside of my full-time job was whiskey and clay. Um, I didn't drink that much, it would be just sipping. Um, and it was really perfect that Aaron was a software engineer and could, he worked from home, so he could just run the kiln whenever I needed it, which sometimes we would go three times a week. So he could just sit there next to the kiln, which with a gas kiln, you have to watch it. I'll explain a lot about that later. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how it all began. Um, we had a lot of friends in Austin in the coffee shop scene, the bar scene, um, just food scene. So they took a chance on us. There was a couple first early coffee shops that were like, you make some cool things. Do you want to like make pottery for me to use for my cappuccino cups, for my latte cups? And that's how it all began. Um, and then the orders kind of just didn't stop. It was an organic growth from there. Um, so yeah, we, we had the home studio. We were really feeling good about it. Um, we had a flow going and then we kind of felt like there was this opportunity to like do it, you know, to, to quit our jobs and really live the life we want of like making things for a living. Um, so that's where Santa Fe comes in. This is 2017. We decided we want to move to Santa Fe. Um, we kind of uprooted our life in Austin. I at the same time applied for a job with Meow Wolf to kind of like soften the blow of just cold moving to a place to, with no job. So I was a um, analyst on their finance team for the first year I lived here. Now I want to gush on Meow Wolf for a minute because I really love their company. Um, they took a chance on me in a way. They were like, of course we'll hire you. And we know you want to leave for art, like leave like us to go do your art eventually. And that's what we all did. So we'll support you. So they supported me. I worked full time for the first six months and then they like weaned me off so that I could like spread my wings and just do pottery full time. It was fantastic. So we had a job in Yowl, or I did. Um, then I got my first studio, which is this one right here on the left. Um, this is on Hickox Street right by the Tune Up Cafe. It was my first space and um, I had it just until March of this year. I was there for about a year and a half. Um, it was my studio and retail space. It's beautiful inside. It's a restored like mechanic garage. Um, it's owned by a woodworker named Jonathan Boyd, who's a good friend of mine, makes amazing work. Um, I think his work is actually in the Oakeith Museum. So we would work together, you know, listening to our bad music and we had a really great vibe. Um, and I would have the side room, he had the garage where he would make his furniture. And like sometimes I would break a tool and he would just make me a new one out of wood. It was a great relationship. <laughs> so that really like just having that space really kind of bolstered whiskey and clay growing as it does. Um, and now I'll show you my current space is this one. So in March of this year, Aaron and I moved into our first like just us, us studio. It's on Lena Street, if you know uh, Santa Fe next to Iconic. And it's a fantastic little garage space. It's where I am right now. And I'll show you around in just a minute. So it has so many features we're happy about. There's a garage door, whereas the last spot we had to like weasel through doorways. as a garage door for us to move pottery in and out of. Um, and the garage door is great for airing out. There's a lot of like dust with pottery. That's not a very good, th good thing to inhale. So yeah, this is our full times now, our full time jobs now. Aaron, I'll go into our job responsibilities in a minute, but Aaron and I were both able to quit our nine to fives and do pottery much more than nine to five, but I think we both really like it. <laughs> um, so yeah, my responsibilities, um, my friend Lindsay, who's also a potter, likes to say that her partner does everything else. She's just a 3D printer. And I kind of feel that way. Like I just make the stuff and Aaron kind of does everything else. Um, so I make everything. Um, I, but I do do a lot of like the marketing and reach out and emailing and stuff. Um, and I, because I have my background in accounting, I kind of manage the books and keep up with that stuff. Um, Aaron is the kiln master. So, um, he, he runs the kiln. So here's us again. Um, he runs the kiln. That's him next to our newest kiln. We got it in August. It's a 16 cubic foot gas kiln, which like it itself is a full-time job. It takes four days to run. And on those off days, like he's working on things. He's fixing the valves, the solenoids, you know, chimney, stuff like that. So he is, he has his hands tied with killing, but he also helps with glaze mixing. Um, something that kind of works for both of us. I am pretty cavalier and I tend to breeze over details. Uh, with something like glazing, you mixing glazes, it has to be a perfect science of ratios of different ingredients. And he's very by the book. And so he makes glazes. He makes a great glaze. So <laughs> he does all the glaze mixing, kiln stuff, and he ships. So he does all of my um, packing and shipping for the pottery. So when we moved out here, this is a little fun tangent, when we moved out here to Santa Fe, we realized that there's this amazing abundance of pine, like pine needles, they smell so good. They're just, it's such an iconic thing. 
And at the same time, we were annoyed that there was all this extra space around our pots in a box. And so we were like, well, why don't we just fill the extra space with pine branches and pine cones? And oh my gosh, people just love it. It's like, I get like weekly emails, messages from people just so delighted that they had like this woof of New Mexico upon opening the box. I don't think we've shipped a spider yet, but I feel like that might happen and I'm sorry. <laughs> so yeah, that's a little about us. Um, I'd like to show you guys my studio a bit here and the process. Um, these photos kind of just show you just work in progress pieces. Uh, on the left is a piece that's just about ready to be trimmed and I'll explain what that means on the right is like a heavy production day. All of those pieces on bats, which are those circles, um, have just been thrown. So yeah, I'm gonna show you guys a demo now. So pardon me if I fumble, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. So the camera is just on me. And I'm gonna take you over to show you like the main production area of my studio. And I'll go over the retail area in a moment back there. So here's the view that shows everything in the production part. So right here is where I'll wedge the clay. Over here is where I throw, and I'll bring the camera closer to show you when I throw. I'm just kind of showing you around right now. Here are my drying shelves. Um, they're specifically put in these places to maximize drying or minimize it. Um, after I throw the piece, I'll explain why we have those, where they, where they are. So, okay, I'm gonna start with wedging. So wedging means you need the clay. So you like, kind of like bread, you need the air bubbles out of there. So I have a couple pieces here um, just ready to go. So as I said in marble clay, I think I said that, that means I mix dark colored clay with light colored clay, stoneware and porcelain, and kind of about like maybe a third ratio for each or for the porcelain. So wedging, as I said, you kind of just knead it in there. You, you work it into itself so that there's no air bubbles. And the reason you don't want air bubbles is because they explode in the kiln and it's never fun. Kiln explosions, are a terrible thing, but it's pretty much every kiln one, you'll have something that popped and it sticks to its neighbors or just causes more problems. So this is a wedged piece of clay. And usually you want it in a ball form, which is why I'm getting it. So there's that. Um, I'm gonna put it over here on the wheel and then move you guys closer so you can see what I'm doing. Okay. So this is the wheel here. I hope you can see that well. Okay. So I have a couple tools ready. I'll talk through the tools when I do the demo. Um, here's my wheel head. I have a, a bat on here, which is just a piece of wood that I throw on so that I can take the bat off and it maximizes the space. You can't really throw it just on the wheel head. Um, it messes with the piece when you try to take it off. So I'm gonna get started. So first thing I do, I'm just gonna get the bat a little wet. And I think the wheel's making a lot of noise, so I'm gonna try to talk louder so you guys can hear. So I'm getting the bat a little wet, dry it with a towel that throwing clay, like throwing is the adjective. Um, the only part that's actually throwing that I think to my knowledge is this, and I don't even like to throw it, but you throw the clay directly centered on the wheel, and that's not even centered. I just push it. I just put it on there and kind of push it. So clay's on there. Now I'm gonna start with centering, which is where I'm gonna just work the clay to be a perfect centered kind of hockey puck little shape. So my hands are soaking wet. I work it into this shape. This, this process right here took me like three years and I still feel like a novice. <laughs> so I'm coning it upward. Coning means you work the imperfections just directly up and then I'm gonna push it back down. So I think this is a pretty good hockey puck. I mean, it's a big one, but, um, and by the way, I'm gonna make a bowl for you guys. So this is the start. You have this just perfectly blank slate. Step one is you take your finger and you drill down. So I'm drilling a hole down into the clay. It looks like a donut kind of, but not all the way to the bottom. I'm gonna open the bottom out. So I'm creating the bottom of the piece, the bowl. I'm flattening the bottom out right now. I'm gonna grab my sponge here. It's like half full of water. And I'm gonna do something my first teacher taught me, which is called centering, but, or I'm sorry, tunnel centering, but I'm also gonna pull up at the same time. So this is kind of a pretty thing. So. Working it upward. I'm also at the same time squeezing water out of the sponge to keep the piece lubricated. Just gonna kind of adjust it a bit and now I'm gonna do the pull. So I'm cutting in to get clay from the bottom there, re-wetting my hands constantly and then I'm gonna work it up. I'll probably do about three pulls on this piece. 
So that's one. Another undercut, another pull. I'm gonna grab a sponge and re-lubricate because the piece is getting kind of dry. And then one more. And I'll make it kind of like a cereal tall bowl thing. So that's the pulling part. Now I'm gonna take my rib tool. This is a little metal, or I'm sorry, a little wooden chunk. And I'm gonna carve into the bottom just to kind of just give it a good shape so it's not so clunky at the bottom here. Um, it's a little off center, so I'm gonna just walk the rib upward and clean off this wet clay. And then that's kind of it. <laughs> that's how you make a bowl. There's other tools I could use, but this one's actually doing okay. So I'm gonna dry all the surfaces around, dry the inside of the piece, and then we're gonna go ahead and take it off. So they don't really like to remove easily, so I have this stick that I just wedge it out of there with. And that's, that's it, I'll bring it closer, you guys can see. So this is just the bowl I made here. It's about maybe seven inches wide. It was about a pound and a half to start with. So now I'm gonna put this down and move the computer so you can see my next step here. So, okay, now I'll talk about the drying shelves a bit. So when a piece is soaking wet like this, I put it on the most dry spot, which is the very tippy top of this shelf. So um, this is closest to my windows and door here, and it just gets the most air because it's like an island. Um, so that's gonna dry for eight hours or so. Usually I go to bed and come back in the morning and trim them. Um, sometimes I just cover it. So it's gonna dry for about eight hours. And then the next step, I'll just come over and talk about this step before. Um, the next step is trimming. So trimming is where you take a piece, um, just like that bowl, and it gets to the point of what's called leather hard, where it's still kind of movable, but it has a shape. It's not gonna mush or anything. Um, and you turn the piece over on the wheel, so it's upside down and you take a metal tool and kind of scrape while it's spinning so that you kind of like form the bottom even better. And then that's, where the, that's the part where you add the stamp. So I kind of like put my logo in there. Um, and if it was a mug, that's the point at which you would add a handle. So handles, I would just roll some clay out right here, um, form, form what I want for the handle, and then attach it to the mug. Um, I have a couple over here I can show you. So once the pieces are um, trimmed and stamped, then they can be like turbo dried. So they go over to this shelf over here, which is currently just a little bit of work, but it's my drying work right now. So as I said, there's some mugs. You can see they're kind of more gray. That's a handle I put on a mug. So they go over here to dry. It'll take, oh, I don't know, about a day or two, depending on the weather outside, for the pieces to get totally dry. And then once they're totally dry, then we glaze them. So as I said, Erin makes the glaze. The glaze is a combination of a bunch of mostly caustic materials, limestone, bentonite, um, kaolin, stuff like that, to make a suspended glass. So just like when lightning strikes sand and it makes that glass form, you're kind of doing that with heating the glass, the glaze ingredients. Um, so we're kind of creating this like cool glass on the outside, it's, it's neat. So basically glaze is a bucket, it looks like paint. I'm gonna dip each of the pieces in them and um, then they get fired. So I'm gonna go back to my PowerPoint here and show you guys the next couple steps. So, okay, those are the shelves. Okay, so one bummer about not having the kiln at the house, which I'll, or I'm sorry, at the studio, which I'll explain in a minute, is that we have to drive stuff. So as you can see on the left, I carefully drive my pottery home. And even more unfortunately, I live like up a mountain, up a really bumpy dirt road. So it's kind of an art. So we drive everything home, put it in the kiln. Um, well, first we lay it out. On the right here, we have this like very flat open trailer. So we lay everything out. Um, and then that is how we kind of size what we need to put in the kiln. And I'll explain more of that in a moment. So here's Aaron loading the kiln. Um, and it's at our house. I have a little video I'll show you of me talking about our kiln in Tasuke, where we live, um, in just a moment. So this is what stuff looks like once it's all completely loaded. I want to explain what the um, uh, those colorful cone things are. So those are these little like uh, I don't know claws that bend down like this kind of, and they tell you at what point or at what temperature basically you are. So you close the door. There's these two holes. You look in the holes 
and it's really hot, you have to put a welder's mask on and you look at those cone things and they bend at the right temperature for glaze melting. Um, so it, you can't just go to a certain temperature. It's like a, it's kind of like a perfect balance of like um, heat and time. So really those identify in the best way at what cone level you are. We fired cone 10 um, and a lot of potters do too. You can mid-range to cone five and it's about a difference of a couple hundred degrees. Cone 10 is 2,400 degrees, which is really hot. So um, now I'm gonna show you a little video of what happens up there. Welcome to Tsuke. This is where Erin and I live and where we keep our kiln. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about the kiln right now and then I'll show you the process. So our kiln is a 16 cubic foot Olsen gas reduction kiln. We fire it with, with propane because natural gas doesn't come out here in Tsuke. Um, it takes about 24 hours to fire and that's why we keep it here at the house rather than at the studio. Um, you have to be monitoring it for the whole 24 hours and so you have to sleep at some point. So. Um, the reason we fire gas is because we redu reduction fire. That's a method of restricting the oxygen in the kiln um, by controlling the chimney opening and closing. Um, and that gives my pottery the kind of caramel toasty tones that I really like. Um, so yeah, that's a little about the kiln. Let me show you what Aaron's doing over here. He's loading all the pottery inside the kiln to fit it and maximize the amount of space. So we maximize the amount of propane used and don't waste any space or propane. So um, you see the pieces around here. This is what takes me, this takes me about a week to produce at the studio in Santa Fe. Um, we lay everything out on this trailer back here so that we can kind of gauge um, the shelf usage, how much space we're gonna need in there and how many firings we're gonna need. Lately I've been making a lot more pottery and having to fire a lot more. So that's kind of it about the kiln. Thanks for watching. Okay, so that's, the kiln world. Um, this photo right here is after. Um, the rock is not something we fired. That's just to weigh down the shelves. So this is what things look like um, before after. I'll go back to the before shot so you can see. There's the before. You see they're kind of gray and dingy um, and there's no sheen or anything and then they get toasted up. Um, so yeah, that's the kiln stuff. And then we unload everything, bring it here to the studio. Um, and so I'm going to pause this discussion and show you our retail area right now. So um, so this, I mean, this studio is so perfect for me. There is this production side, there's the retail side, and like given the circumstances with the coronavirus right now, it is wonderful. I've been able to have private studio visits where people stand over here and I am, I don't know, 15 feet apart over there and we can just kind of interact that way without really being close. It's wonderful. So this is the retail area. Um, this is a set of shelves I had a friend make me to kind of custom fit that space over here as well. Um, I'm gonna walk a little closer so you can see. There's a, there's a sign I had the Meow Wolf guys make for me using their um, laser cutter. So here's our work. Um, it's kind of all scattered around. I kind of try to keep mugs, bowls, tumblers all together. This shelf is reserved to orders. There's a whole dinnerware set for one of my customers. It's kind of where those ones live. Um, and that's, it for the retail end, actually, we've been doing some vintage clothes too. Uh, we print on like old military issue clothes. So when we can open our doors again, we'll be able to sell t-shirts, which I think is kind of neat. Um, okay, so that's the retail end of things. There's one more part to firing. So as I said, we bring everything back here, um, sand it, the bottom needs to be sanded so it doesn't like scratch a surface. Um, sand it and then usually everything gets chipped out or if it's the O'Keefe Museum they get a decal so that is this right here um, they wanted a, a way of making our pottery look um, custom for the O'Keefe Museum and so I know that there's these decals that you can get where you basically print out um, using an inkjet printer I think or laser jet anyway using a heavy iron content in the ink and you can print out basically like a temporary tattoo and you stick it on there and the iron that's in the ink will burn on and it starts black but it turns this lovely like sepia tone brown that I think goes really well with the clay. So those items are really special and they get a special extra firing. So once we put the decal on the clay, Aaron then goes and fires them to a lower cone temperature. I want to say it's like 04 which means I think like 1800 degrees, pretty low for the kiln. Um, but that burns it on. And then those ones are ready for the gift shop of an abacue. So that's kind of it for our process. Um, 
I now want to talk about our inspiration. So this photo is um, taken at our land. Erin and I live part time out in here in Santa Fe, most of the time here in Santa Fe. The other part of the time we live in Terlingua, Texas, which is like an hour north of Big Bend National Park, kind of an hour ish south of Marfa, Texas. Um, we spend a good amount of our time out there. It's really where we call home without getting too gushy, lovey-dovey about this place, which I just love so much. <laughs> um, the first time I went out there in 2015, I like never felt such nostalgia for a place I'd never been. I remember crying when I first got there because it was just this epic beauty. Like you can even see right there, like the sun falling in certain ways, the ground, the plants. Like if this was 4D, you guys, the smell also is amazing. Those, bush, those bushes right there are called creosote. Um, or chaparral or greasewood and they just have the most amazing like desert rain smell. So anyway, high, highly influenced by Terlingua. <laughs> um, and so yeah, the, the colors out there always inspire me. Just the feeling, the energy, like it's so alone. There's almost no people out there, which is why we like it. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's just such like a timeless vibe that I really like to kind of influence my pottery the colors of the ground, you know, the, the blending of the um, cream color and the white. And, and there's a way that like, you can even see there, like the sun will kind of hit the horizon and cause like this bright line, which on my pottery, I do that where the glaze hits the clay, um, it's called flashing. And so there's this bright line that kind of separates this two. Um, it's just a really wonderful feature. So that is everything I have prepared. I wanna talk a little about our future, the future of whiskey and clay and some future experiments and projects, and I think we'll be ready for Q&A. So, um, a couple years ago when we built Whiskey and Clay or decided like, to make it a business, um, Aaron had the idea that we should eventually branch off into doing um, like an umbrella company with multiple, like an umbrella line with multiple brands, including Whiskey and Clay. So our business is formally called Roars, which is my last name. Um, and Lately, we've been kind of shifting into using Roars more. So the future of Whiskey and Clay looks more like Whiskey and Clay has a parent company, which is Roars, and they make ceramics. Um, and I'll show you a piece of ceramics made by Roars here pretty soon. Um, with Whiskey and Clay as a line that will never go away. Um, and then we'll have multiple lines under Roars. That really allows us to kind of free up and do some different stuff. Um, that being said, Whiskey and Clay is just so popular. I am like, so beyond thrilled with the amount of orders and attention it's gotten. So I'm very busy with that one, <laughs> but I do have ideas for new ones. So let me go ahead and grab one of the pieces for Roars and I'll show you what I'm talking about. So my idea is to make a more timeless um, modern piece. So this, for instance, is what we're gonna be doing in the future. It's black clay that I blend myself, black glaze, just kind of a more modern piece, not something that's you know, brown and deserty, more timeless. Um, so that's kind of the future direction there. This very weekend, we have a pretty fun experimental run we're gonna be doing um, interlingua. We're gonna be pit firing. So we have some micaceous clay um, that I made into just some really like simple forms. Micaceous clay is a local clay found here in New Mexico. It's sparkly and um, it's a low fire clay. It has a lot of like roots, um, especially in New Mexico, a lot of native pottery is made of uh, mica, micaceous clay. And um, yeah, there's some interesting folklore surrounding it, how it's supposed to make something you're consuming taste better, water even. So we're gonna try that out. We're gonna do a pit fire, which is exactly what you think. We dig a hole, <laughs> put things in, <laughs> start a fire and let it go for like hours. So those are some experiments we're gonna be doing. Some changes, some new ideas, some fresh ideas. Um, and yeah, there's one thing I forgot. I brought my first piece of pottery and I'm gonna show you guys. It's really embarrassing. Um, way back in Annapolis, when I took a class with Anna, um, this is the first thing that I made. It's pink and chunky and it says KR13 on the bottom. And the feature I really wanna show you, and I hope the camera can pick this up. I didn't even realize this was here. So if you look right there, there's a tiny heart and I don't even know how that happened. That's just the glaze forming. And my roommate, um, she pointed it out to me. She was like, did you see there's a heart in this? Your heart is in this activity. You need to keep doing it. And so, yeah, I felt like I should. So thank you guys. Um, Justina, I'll pass it over to you now for the Q&A. 
Thank you, Kimmy. Welcome. So we had a few questions come in um, during your presentation. Let's see, where should we start? There was a lot of great questions. First question is, where does your clay come from? So we use uh, two types of clay, as I said. So the stoneware, notably, is the one we use mostly. It's from New Mexico clay, which is a store in Albuquerque. Unfortunately, the clay is actually California harvested, but it's a blend that they make in New Mexico clay in their warehouse in Albuquerque. And those guys are amazing. Um, because of the quarantine, they're only doing shipping orders. And we called them and we were like, guys, please help us out. Like shipping that much clay is just ridiculous. We need a whole pallet. And they're like, oh, drive your truck down here. We'll just put the pallet right on it. So New Mexico clay has an A plus in my book. <laughs> a pallet of clay is quite a lot of clay. A thousand pounds, usually. Clay. One, usually once a month. Although, I mean, we've been just so fortunate and busy lately that it may be more than once a month we'll be going to get a thousand pounds or half a ton. Maybe we need to get a whole ton at a time. I don't know. <laughs> All right. Another question that came in, what do you recommend to those who are interested in getting some hands-on experience? Yeah. Um, ooh. I just recommend finding a studio in your town. Um, hopefully you're in a place well, I don't know about these times right now. They might not be opening yet. But for instance, down the street from me, Alina here is Green River Pottery. Theo Helmstetter is a fantastic teacher. Um, he actually reminds me of my first teacher, but he just emailed to launch that he is opening on um, Monday for classes again. Um, I think they'll be spaced out, you know, and, and very careful. But I just recommend finding a, a local play studio um, in your city. Thank you. Um, let's see. Ooh. How do you get the variation in your clay color and how do you control consistency between all the different pieces that you're making? Oh, that is like the vein of my existence. Um, the clay color, so it's the reduction, as I said, with firing. Um, that kiln has a mind of its own. I think I'll be firing it the same way, or Aaron will be firing it the same way, two kiln runs, and they'll look, the pieces will look totally different. Um, I can even just show you a quick example. So for instance, um, heavy reduction or just regular reduction, the clay will look like this. It looks nice and toasty caramel. Without any reduction, it gets kind of yellow, blonde. Same light on the clay, same clay body, same glaze. They're just so different and that's just how it is. Unfortunately, you know, I have orders for that stuff, the brown stuff, and sometimes I have to send it looking more blonde or sandy and people understand, you know, that's kind of like the beauty of it. Um, let's see. Oh, is your pottery microwave and dishwasher safe? Yes, <laughs> um, absolutely. Um, as I said, I make pottery for like bars and restaurants and coffee shops, so they have to be able to dishwash. And they're pretty durable. We fired cone 10, which just means they're a little more hard and vitrified. That being said, like I broke a piece today. They break. <laughs> but yes, microwave and dishwasher safe. Excellent. Um, what does a typical day look like for you? Oh, good question. Um, I'm a runner and so I get my kind of creative juices from running. So my day looks like I wake up pretty early. Usually my cat wakes me up because she's hungry. I go to the studio. I trim the pieces as I said, like sometimes I'll wait overnight for them to dry. I'll go trim them. I'll usually come home, come back home to Tosuke around 11 or 12 in the morning go for a big old run in the uh, weird hilly trails behind my house. And then it, it, kinda, it gives me like a creative boost or like more energy. Um, and then I'll come back to the studio and work until, you know, evening, afternoon. Um, we have kind of a weekly flow. Day, days are different, um, but the weeks are kind of defined by when the kiln run happens. Like it's weird that this thing dictates our life, but it does. Um, we fire once a week and the days the days leading up to firing are always different. So four days leading up to firing, I have two heavy production days where I fill those shelves like I showed you. I make a, sh a ton of pottery. Um, and then the day before firing, I take the whole day to glaze everything. And then the firing day, we load in the morning. Usually Aaron does, he's really good at it. It's like Tetris. Um, we load in the morning and then Aaron fires it. And then I go back to the studio. I have like two or three heavy production days. Aaron's firing the kiln all the while, which means every hour he checks on that thing, and it's just crazy. And then the next two days are the, the cooling days, and that's when we try to have a day off. And, you know, that means, like, going camping or something. 
So for those that um, are interested in getting some experience, there's also some people wondering if you do any teaching. So I, I have taught before. And because I'm next to the potter I mentioned before, Green River, um, it's actually in my lease that I don't teach because they don't want our, our landlords. It's one lady. She's amazing. She does not want competition. So, and that's actually kind of good for me. I, I'm not very patient. <laughs> I have taught before and I can do it. And I think I'm good at it. I've been told I'm good at it. But I just don't like it. <laughs> But th that being said, you know, who knows the future of whiskey and clay? Maybe I'll get a couple wheels and, and just do it. Um, let's see. From a retailer standpoint, do you ever have shipping disasters? And is shipping to your retailers really expensive? <sighs> Actually, it's not that expensive, unless you live in like Hawaii um, or Europe. Um, Yes, uh, and especially lately, I've found that carriers are less careful with stuff. I mean, I know UPS, FedEx, USPS are very overworked right now, and they're amazing people for what they do. But like, I think that they feel like they have more justification to throw stuff because they don't want to get home, get close to a home. So yes, like when the start of the pandemic happened, we had a lot of stuff breaking in shipment, and Aaron and I have it very dialed in. We have this giant roll of cardboard here on the floor next to me that we double wrap pieces in, so we create a box around each piece and then put it in a box and the pine goes all around it. But yeah, stuff breaks and, you know, USPS and FedEx are pretty good about reimbursing. So it's not the end of the world when that happens. Have you ever been inspired or are you inspired by Native American potters in your area? Um, you know, I, I don't know many um, and I've just seen some pottery shards around. Um, you know, for instance, we'll go up to Ojo Caliente and there's this amazing ruins next to the hot springs in northern New Mexico. And really just in New Mexico, sometimes you'll just be hiking and you'll see stuff. Um, I guess I would say my most recent, the micaceous work I was talking about, um, that um, it's kind of an in influence from New Mexico here. Um, but otherwise, not so much. Though it's something I could look into when I do need inspiration. <laughs> Um, so a question that I had was actually, if you had to have a studio in another location, where would it be? In Santa Fe or anywhere? In the world. Ooh, that is such a good question. Um, man. Well, we do have kind of like a setup in Terlingua, so like that's kind of where the secondary one is. It's just a kick wheel. But... You know, I think I would probably put it in Annapolis, like, you know, where my family is and where I'm from. It'd be nice to be closer to them. Yeah. Yeah. We have one more question here. Um, how physically demanding is this career slash passion? Oh what are the effects on your hands? Such a good question. I, that's, oh my gosh, I, I'm, I'm really glad that you asked that. That's something I should have included. It is demanding. Um, I didn't say anything about the fact that I stand. Um, I stand to throw because when I started heavy production stuff, like right when we moved here, I was sitting, you know, as most potters do. I would go to bed like crying, like tears of back pain every night. It was so horrible. Um, so the back is much better with standing. Um, my hands, right now they're fine. Um, but in the winter time, it's like, they're like concrete, like cracking, breaking, they're just so rigid. Uh, embarrassingly, sometimes I sleep with a sock filled with lotion on my hands. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's really demanding in those ways. And if the clay you're using is pretty dry, wedging it like is some serious muscle. Um, you know, not to mention lifting all the clay containers, um, just moving stuff around. It's pretty demanding. And furthermore, um, there's something that everyone should be aware of with clay, which is the clay dust. I think I mentioned with my garage door open. Um, clay dust is extremely um, it's really, it's terrible to breathe. Um, it just kind of sits in your lungs. If you think about it, you inhale it and it just sits in there and it can cause silicosis, which is a blood disease that, will, that can kill you. Um, and so we're really careful. Uh, I wear a mask, which I was wearing before the pandemic around in my studio. And I had a bunch, which was kind of perfect when the pandemic happened. We just had so many of these N95 masks. But anyway, we wear a mask. When we sweep, we have a sweeping compound we put on the ground, all of which is to try and control the dust. And as I said, the garage, we open it and it just makes it so much better. Another question is, how has your life changed since you started doing ceramics full time? 
Oh man, you know what? I am a person who functions off of freedom. When I was working my full-time jobs, I could not fathom that I had 10 vacation days a year. That for me was just crazy. My coworkers at the brewery were always like, oh, Kimmy's always taking off work. And I would just find ways to like, I don't know, work a different schedule. It just really bugged me. So working for myself is such amazing freedom. That would come with any industry. Um, the freedom to just up and leave. Saturday, I'm just gonna drive to Terlingua and be there for a couple days and work on a car and not work on pottery. So there's that freedom right there. I can just put a pause on it. Um, it has increased my stress though. Um, working for myself, working on something that is really volatile. Like as I said, sometimes the kiln runs just don't go. If you had talked to me this time last night, I would be in tears because I opened the kiln door and everything looked kind of yellow, which I've come to love. Um, but there's the volatility aspect and it just causes stress. So I've had to learn how to really manage my stress and calm down, calm down a bit. But um, it's for the better. It's changed my life for the better. Um, and I love knowing... Yeah, I rest easy knowing that I have this background of, you know, a finance job to fall back on. And Aaron has software if that needs to happen. Um, so we feel pretty lucky in that way. But life is so much better this way. You don't miss life as an accountant. I do miss a steady paycheck. <laughs> but, you know, the, the freedom thing um, really is just my favorite. Ooh. Explain work on a car and rebuilding car engines. <laughs> okay, without going too far into it, Erin and I have kind of a side hustle. And really, um, this I realized the other day. When I started becoming a potter full-time, a lot of friends were like, why would you want to make your passion, like, your livelihood, like, this thing you have to do? Like, it's not going to be fun anymore. And that never happened for me. And then I realized the other day that that's because I've always had a hobby on the side of that. <laughs> so my full time is pottery and our hobby on the side of pottery is cars. Um, Aaron and I, uh, right when we started dating, we like would just buy old random cars in Austin and just tinker with them and get them fixed. So, and fix them ourselves. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like a side hustle of ours. Mostly old diesel Mercedes, we have four. We have had a total of 17 cars together. Currently we have 10. Um, if you guys follow my Instagram, I'll be doing every week a post about our fleet. Um, and when you get to the point of having 10 cars, people tend to just give you cars. So like three of them have just been given to us. <laughs> and we're like, okay, fine. We'll just have another yard ornament. <laughs> um, that's not a really good answer to your question. Basically, uh, I don't know. It just fulfills that, you know, tinkering, hardworking side of us. We always like to be busy and responsible for something. And cars are so fun. So speaking of activities outside of pottery, if you weren't a runner or you didn't have that outlet, do you think your pottery would be different or your experience as a ceramicist? I think I would find other ways of, of you know, being inspired. Um, walking maybe. Maybe, okay, let's say no activity, like physical activity. Um, it might be different, yeah. Uh, I think my productivity level would be slower. I think because I'm a runner, I have a pretty high level of energy all the time and I'm able to make a lot, like you saw how fast that bowl happened. Um, so yeah, my work might just be a little bit of a slower pace, um, but I think I would find inspiration elsewhere. What has ceramics taught you about yourself? Mm, it's taught me that I need to focus on details. And I'm 30 now. And I think I'm finally realizing that. <laughs> um, and it's taught me that I like to be responsible for things and have like something that's holding me accountable. Um, you know, with pottery, like pieces are always drying. Like that bowl I made, I now have to have like this mental clock going of like, okay, when is that gonna be ready to be trimmed? Like I can't just be snoozing at home. I need to cover it or I need to be here to trim it. So it's really kind of amped up my responsibility feelings. Um, and the attention to detail for sure with pottery like all those details are really obvious when you mess them up like if i for instance i don't know cut a rim and it's sharp like customers have said to me is there a way i can like sand this and i'm like oh that should have been me i should have like smoothed that before firing it um so yeah it's taught those about myself patience for sure uh with the kiln you know it takes as i said two days to cool so many times I would like I wanted to open it at like 500 degrees and Aaron's like stop get away <laughs> and I'm like I just really want this stuff <laughs> and by the way you open a kiln when it's 200 or less if you open it at 500 degrees like your pieces are gonna like, all explode and it's not good <laughs> so we are getting close to our end I just want to 
end it with this last final question. What sort of advice do you have for aspiring ceramicists out there? I, who, I would say there's, okay, there's one piece of advice I always give that's like a really hands-on piece that's you have to jam your arms into your sides. Your arms have to be steady and the clay is the thing that moves. You know, early potters with their, their arms would move all around like this. Um, I remember my, my, my teacher first put his hands on mine to show me how much force you need to hold that clay. I was like, oh my gosh, I haven't been doing this right at all. So really like jamming your elbows into your sides so that your arms are, sta are, are static and the clay itself is the dynamic part and it does not move. So that's a very tangible advice, I would say. <laughs> the centering is, it, it's so hard. Um, but I don't know, I would say stick with it. As I said, it took me like two years to learn how to center and I don't know. A lot of people give up after that, um, but you'll get it, you know. <laughs> well, thank you for sharing that. Um, this has been an amazing presentation. I learned a lot. Hopefully our audience at home learned a lot. Um, I just want to let everyone know that you will find a recording of this on our blog, Stories from the O'Keefe, sometime next week. So if you want to watch it again or you want to share it with friends and family, please do. And just one more time, we are doing this amazing virtual pop-up store. It's a month long um, and it really highlights Kimmy's incredible work. So please go to gokm.org slash showcase um, to check out Kimmy's work. And again, thank you to our members who are here today. Um, your support made this event possible. If you're not a member and enjoyed this program, please consider joining or making a charitable donation by visiting our website, gokm.org. So I hope you all have a wonderful evening and thank you so much, Kimmy. Thanks guys. <laughs>